Okay, hello and welcome to Pi Data Global 2021. My name is Zach Lee. I'm very happy to be here and be your host for this session. I would like to now welcome Valentino and Paul um, to be this session. And he and she will talk about um, the image classification in retail lesson from the real world. So let's move the time to Paul and Valentina. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Let me just share my screen. So uh, I'm Valentina and together with Paul, we work at Tesco and together we will talk about image classification in retail um, and the lessons that we learned by um, working in a real world uh, um, scenario. Um, so at first, um, I mean, in this presentation, I'll introduce a bit what we do in the data science team at Tesco. Um, and then we then talk about image classification and we will focus mainly on how to generate a data set uh, that would represent the uh, real world problem that you're trying to solve. And what are the challenges that you may encounter? Because especially in deep learning, um, people would focus on like academic uh, data sets. So the only part you would focus on is the design uh, of the network and the architecture that you would use. But actually there is a lot uh, about the data set generation when you work on um, a real world uh, scenario. So the data science team um, at Tesco, essentially Tesco is a grocery company and we are in, in the United Kingdom and um, Central Europe. Um, it's the biggest supermarket in UK. So we have like more than 3,000 stores um, in the United Kingdom and more than 300,000 colleagues. And this is to say that, um, I mean, the volume generated um, is quite big. So also the data that we have available um, is, um, is not, uh, like it's quite a lot. And um, so being like the largest supermarket in the UK, um, the data science team is quite uh, big and well-established. We are more than 70 uh, colleagues and we are involved essentially in many departments, almost all the departments um, in, the, in the company. Um, we won't focus much about what we do, but um, on Saturday, there is gonna be a presentation about uh, the stack that we use in the data science uh, team at Tesco. Um, so if you're interested, please uh, attend that uh, talk. Now uh, let's focus on the image classification. So for those of you who are not familiar with it, essentially um, the image classification is the problem in which you have a set of images, you have a set of classes, and for each image you want to associate a class. So as you can see in here, for example, you would have um, some images, you have, so you have some classes in here, and then you need to label each image with a class. So these images are images of a checkout where a person would scan, um, would scan a product. Um, and so in this case, for example, what would you see in this image? We can see that the person is scanning um, a bread. And then the next one, if you look among these classes, the person is scanning mango and so on. But uh, of course we don't wanna do this uh, manually, but how can we do it automatically? So one way is um, convolutional neural networks um, in deep learning. So essentially you build a data set where for each image you associate a class and then you have this data set and you provide this data set to a convolutional neural network, which will learn uh, to classify those images. So the image will go through this neural network, which is composed of um, lots of um, convolutional layers. And the objective of each convolutional layer is to output a feature. Um, and at the end, you would have a fully connected layer, which will output um, the probability of this image to belong to each of these classes. So for example, in this case, you have a mango and what you expect the network to learn is that you will have a low probability for each of the classes, except for the mango class, which would have a probability close to one. So what is the issue now? The problem, I mean, the, the, the work is, uh, can be split into two stages. The first is um, build a data set that would be as representative as possible 
of the um, problem you are trying to solve. And then the second stage would be once you have right, the right data set, then you want to choose the right network and train the model in order to be able to classify each image of this data set. And then in the end, you will end up with a model or a neural network that will be able to classify the images in your, um, in your real uh, scenario. So the first thing is you need lots of labels and lots of images. And now the issue is how would you generate those images? You can go on or like search existing data sets, but you won't find data set with checkouts, for example. And so one way to do it is because we are um, a supermarket, we have uh, checkouts and the checkouts are able to generate some logs that will say at this given timestamp, um, this product was scanned and the product is labeled with the barcode, which is called a GTIN. And then you also have cameras on top of the checkout uh, and each frame of the camera is associated with a timestamp. So you can combine the two and then generate a series of images that will have a barcode as a label. Now, easy, no? You think, fine, I can generate the data set automatically and I don't need to spend much money uh, on people looking at the images. Unfortunately, that's not really the case. And here is an example. So let's say in this case, uh, a person has scanned an alcohol bottle, which you can see in here. Um, and you extract like, let's say five seconds around um, the scanning of the product. But then you can see all these images are going to be labeled with the same barcode. Can you see something silly? So first of all, it's the empty checkout. So these two images are going to be labeled as um, with the same barcode, but actually they don't show anything. And so this is the first unanticipated situation that you will encounter when you want to build such a data set. Then you would have another problem, which is the COVID checkout. So let's look at this. This will have also another barcode um, label. However, we only see like the heart of a person. So again, we should be able to find a way to say that we can't use all these images as um, part of our data set. And yet another issue is actually what class are you going to associate these to? Because yes, you can say this is an alcohol bottle, but we can also see some non-alcoholic bottles here. So what are we gonna say? Does it contain alcohol bottle or non-alcoholic bottle? And of course, all these things will impact the performance of the model trained if we had left um, all these um, labels uh, in the data set. So these are not only the uh, unanticipated situations that you will encounter, but let's say we have uh, fruit, for example, and now we want to classify bananas. So the one you can see here are bananas, fine. We can label them as bananas. And then you also have bananas in a pack. So in a package like this, but you can still see they are bananas, so that's fine. But then what if you actually have them in here? Could you say that this is a banana or maybe it looks like lettuce? And could you say that this is a banana? And again, you need to remember that all these images would end up with a labeled banana. Um, provided to the model when you train it, if you don't handle these cases. And then there is another issue. So Tesco, for example, is, um, um, is targeting like less uh, usage of plastic. So they introduced a brown bag instead of plastic when you buy loose products. Now, let's say we want to use the same, um, the same approach as before where you have the automated labeling. Then again, this might be labeled as apples, but can you really see that they are apples or it's just like a brown bag? So maybe the solution would be to have a brown bag class, but that cannot be generated automatically. So how do we improve all these labels? One way is uh, let's use some human labelers and tell them, give them, like present the pictures, say these are the classes you can choose from go on and label and refine the data set. However, it's not that simple because um, as you can see, the, you can come up with a quite um, not easy um, set of rules. So it becomes um, quite complicated. 
And then let's say we are the labelers also, we will encounter issues like this. So this image, for example, will be labeled as occluded or empty because it doesn't show anything, but actually it does show a person scanning a barcode. So is this correct if we had labeled it as occluded or empty? And then the same here, a person is holding something under his hand. Paul and I know because we have seen plenty of these images that this is either an avocado or an onion because they easily roll on the checkout and they can fall. So you tend to cover them with your hand to make them stable. But um, is this really an avocado? Could you say that? And same here, is it an avocado or a mango? And for the other um, images as well. So even though it seems that um, image classification would be an easy task, actually there are a lot of issues that you can already encounter only at the beginning when you want to generate the data set and we haven't even touched the um, part of the model training. Um, this is another example where, let's say you have multiple images of the same scan. So a person is scanning something and you get like an image for each like second on so on. And so in here, are you able to recognize this one? Most people would say, I have no idea what this product is. But then if I show this one, I'm pretty sure everyone would have an idea that this is an alcohol bottle. So even when you present images to the labelers, you need to be careful on what you select and how you select your data. And now I'll pass it into like to Paul for other issues encountered. Okay, yeah, so when you're dealing with uh, real world data sets, uh, one problem that uh, is very common is that the data, set, the data is very imbalanced. So for example, here is an overview of, of some of the classes that we had in our model. And you can see that there, so this is a logarithmic plot and you can see there are like many orders of magnitude between the most uh, common and the least common classes. So you have like a million images for the most common class and then under a thousand for the, for the least common one. And, and so that kind of makes it uh, tricky when you actually go to train a model because the model might not learn very much about the, the very uncommon classes. So there are standard ways of addressing this. You can oversample, you can undersample. There are some papers that say that oversampling actually works quite well for image classification, but then you actually try to do that in the real world and you have a, a huge imbalance like here, you can't really oversample because if you try to oversample to get everything to a uniform distribution, your data set would be so big that you can't even train for one epoch. And then on the other hand, if you undersample, of course you're throwing away some data. So, and what we found that worked uh, the best in, in our case was to use undersampling, but to do it in a kind of smart way where you try to throw away data that's kind of similar to other data that you already have in the, in the data set. So for example, if you have one scan of a product, you take only a few images of that scan for the less common classes, uh, for, for the more common classes and, and all of the images for the, for the less common ones. So this is kind of what you can do in order to create the distribution that's easier for training on. But then you have another problem because you're training the model on one distribution. But then when you actually want to deploy the model, you know it will encounter a different distribution. And that might be the same like the distribution of the original training set, or it might again be quite different depending on how you collect the data. So, so you have to do something in order to make the model uh, work on the real distribution. And then also when you evaluate your models and then you maybe have multiple models and want to compare them against each other, you need to decide how you want to evaluate them. Like, do you consider every class as equally important, even though some of them maybe, like maybe some products are so rare that the model will only see like one of them a week. And then is it really important that the model is extremely accurate on those? And, but then also you might have uh, requirements uh, from like, a, a, like independent of the data itself, but coming from the business that tells you it's very uh, important that the model gets this class right, because it actually means we have to, I don't know, do an intervention or uh, inconvenience a customer or something like that. So the, there's many factors to kind of keep in mind. And now to come back to this uh, second point to that the distribution that you train the model on might be different from the one at test time. So there's a, so if you assume that uh, after you train a model, that the probabilities that the model outputs, like from the, the last layer, which is a, a softmax in, in a normal classification case, so the output is, is kind of, it looks like a probability distribution, like it sums to one, you have values from zero to one. 
Um, and if you assume that this is actually a correctly calibrated probability distribution that tells you, uh, like if it, the model says 0 0.8, that means in 80% of the time it should be correct. Uh, so if you assume that's the case, then there's actually a nice way to convert the model from one distribution to another. So here on the, in the graph on the right, you can see uh, first at the training set, and we see in the training set there's mostly apples and then uh, pears and then a, a few less bananas. So this is the distribution we train on. So the model kind of expects to see more apples than pears than bananas. But then at test time, we, we know maybe we uh, looked at some, some logs or we, we know something about how what happens in the store. We know that actually the model will see fewer apples. So the distribution is quite different from the training distribution. And now if you have uh, a model trained on this training set and you uh, apply it on some image and you get an output like this, so the model is very sure that, that it's seeing an apple, then this might not actually be the output that you want because in, in, the, in, in the store at test time, you expect to see less apples. So maybe the model should be less confident. So what you want is you want to kind of transform this output to get a, an, an output that's kind of ad adapted to the real distribution that you know is, is, is there at test time. And the, there's actually a very easy way to do that. And this just follows from uh, Bayes theorem, which is that you can just rescale the probabilities, uh, these output probabilities by the ratio of these two distributions. And then you have to normalize again. And then you get this transformed output. And that's actually assuming that the original model was well calibrated and this transformed on the B2. And this is kind of nice because it means that you can do this kind of undersampling, for example, uh, to, uh, to uh, have a training set that's easier to train on. And then you can transform the model to make it adapted to the actual distribution you would see at test time. But this kind of assumes that the model is well calibrated in the first place, which is for, for neural networks, I mean, there's some indication that it's sort of true, but they're also often quite overconfident. So you can't be sure that the calibration is, uh, is that great. So, and, and if you assume that it's not, it's not well calibrated, well then, instead of just having this ratio between the two distributions, you can actually think about changing all these parameters arbitrarily. So you have a number of classes, free parameters that you can use to adapt the model to any, any new distribution. And of course, then the question becomes, how do you choose these parameters, which can be quite a few if you have a lot of classes. So you can think about doing some kind of optimization or something like over these. And if we go back now to an easier problem, which is just binary classification, there's kind of a similar problem there. If you want to cl classify something into class A or class B, you have a model that outputs some value between zero and one. What you do is you just set the threshold. And depending on where you set the threshold, you will uh, have uh, more outputs on class A or more on class B. And you can adapt that to the distribution. And if you have two models and you kind of want to compare them, but the thresholds might not be equivalent between the two, the, what we often do, but it's, it's just the, the standard thing to do is to, to use a metric that's kind of independent to this, uh, to this setting of the threshold. So for example, the area under the curve, area under the ROC curve. And that's, that's very nice because you have just have this one number and you don't have, don't have to worry about setting thresholds and looking at how the performance changes over the threshold. So it would be nice to have that also in the multi-class setting. But it turns out that's actually quite hard in the multi-class setting. And there's, there's multi-class versions of AUC, which uh, kind of sounds like they would work, but they actually don't. Like if you do this rescaling that I mentioned before, then the, these metrics change, so they're not independent. And there's other metrics like this uh, mean average precision that's similar to what's used for object detection, but that also changes uh, when, you, uh, when you do this kind of recalibration. So from what I know, there isn't really any uh, standard metric that you can use that's independent on this kind of uh, complete uh, recalibration of the, of the distribution. So that's a bit unfortunate, but it means you have to be quite careful when evaluating uh, different models. And when you have two models and one of them looks better than the other, you have to check that this is actually still true after you calibrate the models uh, to make them perform better on your test distribution. So now let's go to a different problem, which is also has something to do with distributions. But in this case, it's, it's about not the distribution of the classes, but the distribution of your input data. So this is, uh, this is just a problem of generalization, basically. And, and the, the, 
the, the, the main point is that if you have two models that perform that are trained on some training set and then tested on some unseen test set and they, they perform similarly well on the on the test set that doesn't mean that they are equally good at generalizing to new settings they did generalize to the test set but if you now collect a new test set in maybe a slightly different setting one of the models might be a lot better at adapting to that than the other and very early in, in our development we had a situation like that where we had one simple model which was just a couple of convolutional layers very few parameters and we just trained it from scratch and we had another model which was based on the which was a transfer learning model based on some standard model trained on ImageNet, which had a lot more parameters and they both performed basically exactly the same on the test set that we had and so we kind of thought maybe we prefer the smaller model because it has fewer parameters it's faster to run but then we actually got so this is Kind of the, the images image at the top is sort of the images we had for the training and the test set but then a bit later we got some new data from a different store where it, it looked very different like the image at the bottom and you can see well the lighting is quite different but also like the background is different and the, the sort of till uh, that stay in the background and it turned out the transfer learning model actually worked perfectly well on this new data set so slightly worse than on the old one but still quite well but the small just simple model just didn't work at all so you can see actually the prediction here is the prediction of the simple model and they just said alcohol bottle instead of banana which is not not correct at all uh, and so you can do stuff like uh, data augmentation uh, changing brightness contrast so on and that can help a bit but real world effects can be quite sub subtle especially when it's about like patterns in the background instead of just uh, global shifts in, in color and brightness and so on and there's this this uh, recent paper that i thought was quite interesting and kind of uh, fits our experience as well and it basically says that that uh, the way you get robustness to out of distribution samples is, is to use a model that has just seen a lot of images during its training time and that might be a model that's pre-trained on a large data set and then fine-tuned on a different task and as long as you don't fine-tune it until it forgets everything it has ever seen as long as you, you don't fine tune too much, then you actually get better robustness than with a model that's only trained on one specific task. And then, so this was kind of a, a kind of a simple case of distribution shift where for a human it's still very clear that this is still a banana and it's just the background that changes. You can have a bit more tricky situations where the, the, the thing that shifts in the distribution is actually quite close to what you're trying to detect. So, for example, here we had a model that, that's just supposed to tell us whether there is a product in the image or not. So, for example, here these two images would be no product because there's, there's the till and then there's only some, some people, but there's no product. And then on the right, you have images that should be classified as product because you do still see people, but then there's also a little bit of a product peeking through. So this is kind of the task the model is supposed to do. But then we actually got images from a new store and suddenly there was we, we saw that the model always said there was a product and this was just because they, they put a sticker on the till which you can see here and well the sticker is it's not the background of the till that the model was used to and it's also not the person so the model said it was a it was a product yeah if there are questions i guess yes okay so um i get a question from philip um I would like to know whether it would be possible to adopt a classified problem of a single class classification image problem into a multi-class single image classification image problem. The latter problem would involve detecting different object in a given image. Yeah, so that's something we did explore, but in, in the setting that we were looking at, like at self-checkout, there's almost there's mostly only a single product visible. There's very few cases where there's multiple products, and also for the multiple products, we don't have the labels, so we would have to like uh, have human labelers label them. So it's a lot of effort. So uh, for that reason, we just focused on the single class uh, model. Okay. Okay. Another question is: Could you share like on the data selection progress for human classifiers? Consider how much data test code classifies or it doesn't automatically. Yeah, so that's definitely an important thing. I mean, mostly we used human human labeled data as, as a test set to evaluate the model. So it was mostly uh, getting a representative sample of all the classes and the different like stores and checkouts that we have. 
because actually getting uh, human labelers to label the training data is you need a lot of labels for that so it's the test that is the most important okay and another question from robert is that of oversampling or undersampling cannot you just read the back programming error in fact yeah you you can you can do that. you can size? you can wait just to use waiting instead but then you still have the issue that uh, it, like in most batches you won't have a sample from the from the from the under underrepresented classes so you train the model a long time in one direction and then at some point you get one sample and you wait the error a lot uh, and then you just jump you have a big jump uh, in, in the weights so i'm not sure if it would work as well and also if you do for example if you do oversampling every oversampled image will be augmented differently by the data augmentation so that actually helps it's, it won't be exactly the same image okay uh, one more question from video again how could uh, one add additional permanent to the training model so that so to enhance the detection accuracy since those um permanent did not have the same 2d I would like structure that image have. Um, how could one add those permanent in an NN architecture? Yeah, so I mean that's a nice part about neural networks. They're quite flexible. So you would you have the convolutional uh, layer stack, which kind of gets you the features from the image. And then what you could, for example, do is at the last layer where you flatten all the convolutional information into just a single vector, you could add some additional entries which come from some additional data. But oh. uh, I mean, in our case, you don't really have that because the, the point was to classify the product from the image alone. And we, at that point, we don't have any additional data. So, yeah. Okay, last question. Can you briefly explain that um, the use case of the model and how good it has to be? Yeah, so, so this was mostly uh, uh, just an in investigation of uh, what we can do with kind of data that's that's available in Tesco because we already have the cameras and we wanted to see uh, kind of what, what we can do for that. And for example, one use case would, could be to improve the customer experience at the till when's the, yeah, just make it, make it easier for the customer to check out. Okay, thank you. Our time is over. Could you kindly move to the discussion to snap or get a ton? Um, thank you, Paul and Valentino um, to talk and for being part of the Pi Data Global 2021. Thank you so much. Thanks. Cheers.